Okay, welcome to part three of machine learning with R. And in this section, we are going to actually get into our machine learning techniques a bit. Uh, once again, just want to remind people this is a very introductory exploration. Uh, we're not going to be very comprehensive. And so there are plenty of machine learning courses online that you can pursue in greater detail. This is just a kind of warm up getting you started with those things. So first I want to talk about k-means clustering. So k-means is uh, a method whereby we pick a certain number of centers, k is the number, um, and we attempt to group the data into clusters around those centers. And so the algorithm starts with a random center points in the data and then tries to move the center uh, to minimize the distance for to other points in the cluster until it converges on on a good fit and so this is you know an approximation technique it doesn't have a deterministic outcome unless the data is strongly clustered on its own then it, it will often arrive at the same outcome every time um, but you can expect to see something different every time you run this algorithm every time you iterate. This is just a, an illustration of the idea of the, the clustering. And so we're going to look at that in the R context. Um, a couple of things to note that it requires numeric variables. Uh, we're, we're computing a Euclidean distance, so we need, we, we can't use character variables, factor variables. Um, unless you wanted to convert them to, to numeric measures, you could do that. So I'm working with the no character data extract that we constructed earlier. And I also have removed the elements uh, for summons number and street code because those are not particularly interesting. They are uh, just sort of ID type numbers with, that we don't have a strong reason to associate any causality there. So I've removed those to simplify things. And then finally, uh, I have rescaled the data. So because it's a distance metric, right? Think about we're measuring something like feet from the curb. If we measure that in millimeters, we're going to have a, a very large magnitude number. If we measure it in meters, it'll be much smaller. If we have two variables, one measured in millimeters and another in meters, the millimeter one would be way overweighted in our calculation just because of the scale. So we have to uh, standardize the data, which sets the mean to zero and the standard deviation to one across everything. So just uh, the easy way to do that is to apply this scale function. Um, so I'm using the tidyverse mutate step and scaling each of the variables in our collection. Uh, to create a new rescaled data set. So rescaled parking is the small sample. Rescaled parking 2 is the large sample of all 42 million observations. Now I've run this off screen before starting to talk because the rescaling of the full data set is a little bit time consuming and again makes me a little worried about my processing overhead. So all that I've already run, the lines from 302 up through 340. Now I'm just going to show you 340 so that we can see that when we do a summary of the data, we can see, yes, it has been rescaled. All the means are zero. Uh, it looks like it worked as advertised. So then we can go in and actually look for the centroids in our data. And if I do that for the, um, the first parking sample, uh, you'll notice I get an error. Uh, K-means data can't deal with not available data. So this um, is a problem for us. We're going to have to deal with that. And one way to do that is to use the NA omit function. So this is on line 347, which screens out the not available data and uh, gives us results from a clustering. So we have uh, in this case, uh, clustering with one uh, cluster much larger than the others. The others 
relatively small, and the smallest only 7,000 out of the 433,000. Uh, there's a report on where the centers lie. It's a bit difficult to um, draw a judgment from that, especially the nature of this data. Uh, and then the clustering vector uh, shows us for at least the first thousand observations which cluster each observation falls into. We're going to see another visualization of this in just a moment that will give us a better feel for the data. Um, and in this case, the um, sum of squares by cluster tells us that the 99% of the variation in this data is between the different clusters. So we've actually screened out a lot of variation, but you have to be a little cautious of that. What did I do here? I ran the k-means on the non-scaled data. And so that means that these very high numbers, like the issuer code, are the going to be the important variables for contributing to the sum of squares. The numbers like feet from the curb that are relatively small are not significant in this in this in this case. So probably the clustering has just taken care of issuer code and not worried very much about the, the rest, which is why it reports that it's got this great fit. And so that's an example of something that you you should not do when you're working with this kind of k-means data. So when I run it on the rescaled data, you can see that uh, the, the amount of variation that is accounted for by the differences between the clusters is now down to 42.6%. So that's you know a moderate fit, but a much more realistic fit than 99%. Uh, and in this case, the, the sizes of the clusters are quite different. They're much more equal in size. The measurements on the centroids look fairly different, although I won't go into detail about that. Um, and just a very different character of result. So we have have that. I will run one time, just one time, so you see uh, that it takes a bit of time, is running the k-means against the full 42 million observation data set. Now this is... Um, you know, it's an iterative approximative process. It is, um, so there's a lot of computation going on, but we can see that, that it does succeed in eventually producing a result. So I'm gonna let that run for a bit and talk ahead in the code until this uh, process finishes. We'll see about how long it runs. Um, so, you know, what happened here, as we mentioned, k-means cannot work with not available data. If we believe that the, the observations with not available data are important to us, we may not want to just drop them out, right? So we uh, may want to impute the, val the values for those. Impute means you're, you're making something up to insert instead of the not available data, but you're making it up according to some rules. Sometimes people use the mean, sometimes people use the median of the remaining data, uh, which are basic methods. You can do those with the R package hmisc. Uh, there's also the mice package, um, which has more sophisticated methods. And there's a, actually a book by Roderick Little on missing data that, you know, if you really want to dive in and, and study all of the methods to deal with missing data, I'd refer you to that. So now we see our result uh, did succeed in clustering the full 42 million observation data, and we've got cluster sizes of, you know, 13 million, 14 million. Um, so pretty interesting that it, it's able to do that uh, in not too long. And we have uh, cluster means. Um, let me just look at the numbers for violation code. So 0 0.07, 0 0.27, 0 0.21. Is that very different from what we found before? Uh, pretty much, yeah, very different. Um, centroid points, right? So this is, again, when the data doesn't exhibit its own sort of strong structure, the clusters can form in a number of different ways. Um, and here we actually uh, explained more of the variation of the data, 51%. Um, and again, we dealing with data at this scale, it's very hard to um, tell a simple story of the causality of why that, that is. Um, but you'd have to delve in and iterate 
uh, to do that. So I'm going to mention a method for iteration in just a second. Um, so when I um, want to examine, going back to the issue of the not, a, not available, the missing data, um, I can check whether I have missing data uh, for observations with an isNA function. And I can do that variable by variable and do a table. So th lines 360 to 366 are this uh, quick check. And I can find that, OK, violation location has 64,000 missing items, because missing is true. But for the remaining variables, there are no missing observations whatsoever. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to conclude that the easiest thing to do is get rid of that one variable that has missing data. And then we will have a complete data set um, that no longer has anything about the violation location in it. Um, so I've just dropped that column in lines 370 and 371. Um, and actually, I want one of these lines for my rescaled data as well, uh, parking 2. Although I might not run a computation on parking two again, but just to be complete, let's let's do that. And now, when we try again, we can do something a little different. Be, to get around this issue of the random starting points, we can just iterate and we can run multiple tries. So there's a, a parameter called end start that I can. Uh, specify. So when I say n start equals 5, it's going to run the k-means algorithm five times instead of just once and average the, the results so that we get uh, something that's hopefully less sensitive to the random starting point and more representative. Uh, you can see that for the 400,000 observation uh, data, this still takes a little time, right, because we're doing it five times. Uh, I certainly am not going to run this for the 42 million observation data set because that will definitely take much longer. Um, but we should have a result for the, um, the smaller data set. Yep, here it comes. Um, let's just look at that cluster size. And this, interestingly, um, even though this is the rescaled data, has given us these unbalanced cluster sizes. One of these clusters is quite small, 79, 28. Um, and again, we could go back and compare the cluster means. And you know, if you're running this analysis, you would you would want to basically iterate as many, much as you could um, in order to get a robust result that's not going to be sensitive to change. Um, and again, it's it's more of a judgment call. Your kind of cost-benefit analysis of how much time do you have to work on this um, versus you know the significance of improving your your result or making your result more robust. So again, we're hovering around 50% variation ex explained by the difference between the clusters, um, which is all right. That's okay. Um, and so if we want to visualize this a little more, we can only visualize in two dimensions. So I'm going to just look at this defined feature set of violation precinct versus issuer precinct. So just those two variables. And I'm going to create a clustering just on the basis of those two variables instead of all the variables in the data set. So if I try this for the, and this, this will show you the difference again between the scaled and non-scaled data. So the first try of this is going to be for the unscaled data, uh, which I'm calling my K. And the second try on line 391 is for the scaled data. 
um, which I'm calling my k scaled. Now, the results of that we can visualize using uh, something from the uh, facto extra package. Um, and the command is fviz cluster. And there's a link here if you want to learn more about this method. I've just kind of applied that technique from that blog post. And um, with some settings, you know, to determine your look and feel of the, the graph, uh, fviz cluster does the work of visualizing how the k-means data is clustered. And here comes our result. So still, even though we're just working on the sample day, still a little bit large to do 400,000 points. Um, and you can see the clusters are uh, fairly kind of imbalanced, right? The um, There's this huge number uh, down at the bottom left. Um, then there's another segment and there's a few outliers with this high number of violation precincts for violation precinct, but it, it almost seems like the data is dominated by how close it is to the origin. Like there's points close to the origin, there's another group not so close, and then uh, this, I believe, is reflective that that data is dominated by the non-scaled nature of the data. Um, when we look at the scaled data, we actually get a different kind of result. Still, um, well, maybe it's not that different. <laughs> it's still dominated by this uh, point close to the origin. Note that the clusters have sort of switched number. I mean, it's cluster three now near the origin. The number of the cluster is actually kind of arbitrary, right? That's, that's random. Um, so we don't assign meaning to the fact that it's the first cluster or the third cluster. It's just an arbitrary label. Um, so again, it's a complex uh, situation and we have these numbers that are um, not scalar, or right? the, the precinct is just a label for, for something. So there's a connection between the violation precinct and the issuer precinct as we discussed earlier. Um, this graph maybe gives us a little bit more insight into it, but I won't try to push a, a narrative onto it. Uh, we can try this for other features. So for example, if we look at the violation precinct versus feet from the curb, are there different groups? Like is, in certain areas, does the um, do people park further away from the curb or not? Is there anything we can say about this? Uh, the unscaled data reveals a pattern that's going to pop up on the screen in a moment, uh, where the data has been sort of sliced vertically here, where the uh, violation precinct is the thing that matters. And it's almost like, okay, everything with the low violation precinct is in one group, uh, middle, middle levels in other groups, and then high violation precinct number gets pushed into the, into the blue uh, group one here. That's actually kind of indicative of the pattern doesn't seem to depend on the feet from curb so that there's not a strong relationship. And when there's not a strong relationship, we can see that the clusters can end up being kind of arbitrary depending on, again, those start points. Uh, when we scale the data and run it again, um, this time it chose to slice the data horizontally, right? So it groups all of the high feet from curb data together, the middle level and the low level gets split into two groups, one with a high violation precinct number and another with a low violation precinct number. So this is just again an indicator that it's um, maybe hard to know what to expect. I'll just run one more of these. This is feet from the curb versus vehicle year. So do newer vehicles have more issues with uh, parking away from the curb or not. Um, here we're, we're a victim of that issue with the vehicle year. Remember when we looked at the data, uh, there was a huge number of zeros for vehicle year, which basically meant the vehicle year hadn't been entered, but it hadn't been entered as missing, it had been entered as zero. And so that really kind of messes up our results here. So that's a case where 
to be complete, we really want to go back and clean up that data, get rid of the zeros, replace them with the missing uh, NA. And if you don't do that, you end up with these sort of bizarre arbitrary results. Although we might not expect there to be a relationship between the year of manufacture of the car and the feet from the curb. Maybe something that might be more reasonable would be if we took a look at the um, type of vehicle, like do trucks park further from the curb than sedans? Um, that just just an idea of a relationship to look at. And also just to point out that we can plot across multiple dimensions. Uh, we can kind of get a 3D view of this data. Um, this is lines 442 to 451. And even the two-dimensional data, as we've seen, can be difficult to interpret. Um, this is uh, perhaps even um, trickier to interpret, but we can combine you know, multiple dimensions. So this data does not um, limit to just two variables. This is all of the variables in the data set, uh, but we have, in this case, uh, picked two dimensions right that that actually combine some of those data um, oops did I not run let me just try running that again okay in this case I don't want to apply the features so that I can see the full data set so if we don't add the features, uh, which limits the data to just the selected feature variables, then we will get the dimensional plot that um, combines the data across, uh, reduces the data into two dimensions that are combination vectors of other dimensions, um, and gives us a plot. Um, I guess this could, you know, tell us a little bit of is there a strong clustering effect or not? Um, do we see separation? Here we, we, we see some overlap or close borders, so it's, it's really quite mixed, these results. But again, another variant that is um, a bit tricky to interpret. Okay, so the final thing we'll talk about with k-means is the um, process of determining which k do we want, right? We, we've been doing a lot of this work where we said, okay, let's just try four, four centers. Um, but there is an art to finding the correct number. And so what I'm going to do is generate a function. Um, this, this is outlined on this uh, link in the code. But create a quick convenience function to compute the sum of squares at each level of k, right? So we're going to iterate from k. k equals 1, obviously, is meaningless. That, that's, that's, there is no clustering when you have only one center. But, so we start from k equals 2, just looking at two clusters. And we're going to iterate up through 20 clusters, setting our max k to 20 on line 478. And we'll be able to compute the sum of squares uh, for each of those k. So our convenience function on line 470 does that. Um, we apply it for all the range of k in line 481 and save the result in a vector. And then we create a little mini data frame uh, to represent those results so that we can then plot it. And the plot happens in lines 490 to 493. So it's called elbow because what we are looking for typically is what's called an elbow or a kind of kink in the curve where the results sort of flatten out. Now, as we add centers, we're going to reduce the, the sum of squares. This is just uh, in the nature of things. It's just like in a regression, when you add additional variables, you can fit things better. But there's a trade-off. Um, you, you're always going to get a little bit better when you add a variable. If it's not a significant difference, you may want to say to yourself, gee, it's better to keep the model simple, not try to overfit the data, and just rely on those variables that have a major contribution.
So this is the same idea, except because of the randomness of the start points, the curve doesn't always go down in a continuous fashion. You sometimes have these bumps, right, where from five centers to six centers, the, the result actually gets worse. We explain less of the fit with six centers than we do with five. Um, sometimes that might be driven by the structure of the data, but sometimes it's just a random artifact of the start points. Um, but so we can see as we add centers, for the most part, the variation drops pretty steadily until 10 and then bounces up again, then drops a bit more until 12. Then the, the improvement really sort of tapers off. Now, this again is going to be your judgment of like how important it is to get a really super fit or how important is a simple, easy to under, understand model, right? If we are trying to, for example, cluster customers into different types and you need to then explain to your sales force, there are 20 different types of customers. Here, you, Here's how you deal with each of them. Uh, that's going to be harder than explaining five types or 10 types. So you have to evaluate, you know, maybe 10 types is a good enough fit uh, and we'll, we'll stop there. And this sort of kink in the curve is something we can look at as an indicator of that. So that's um, that's um, I think a good place to stop. So we'll stop here with this discussion of k-means. And the next segment, we will get into a discussion of training and testing data. But, but let's pause here. Thanks for listening and, and drop back in for the next segment.